Thank you all for joining us today. Um, uh, I'm Nate Parsons. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer of Parsons TKO, and uh, you know I'm excited to to talk to y'all today. And you know we're going to be diving in today to talk about why you need a marketing CTO and what is a marketing CTO, and you know why is that different from a regular CTO. Um, you know, and part of why I wanted to talk uh, or give this talk today is that we keep running into situations where clients are wondering. You know, why are all these fancy engagement tactics that you see on, you know, medium posts and on the web and other things so hard to make part of their day to day? Like what's getting in the way of them adopting more sophisticated outreach tactics over time? You know, and why, why is that challenging? And, you know, one of the things that kind of made me think about this, we kept hearing, sort of, you know, things like this. And I just wonder if any of these sort of sound familiar to folks. Uh, you know, the fundraising team might say something like, uh, we want to target a very specific set of people that we think are likely to give in a certain scenario. And then, you know, the communications team looks into it and they're like, oh man, we're going to have to make an Excel file and, and do a lot of manual labor to make this happen. You know, uh, or another thing that we've seen happen is that people are just wondering, you know, their, their higher ups are wondering why the time and effort they're putting into things isn't creating the value or the benchmarks that they see on the web or other things like that. And they're just wondering why things aren't working. And then, you know, the comms team looks and they say, well, there's all this optimization and this improvement that we think is in there that we just don't have time to do. We don't have the tools to do. We're not set up to do. And, you know, from the leadership's perspective, they're just wondering why you haven't already done that. That isn't that, isn't that your job, you know. And there's all these complexities for why that doesn't happen, and you know, part of that is that outreach has become a real team sport. You know, in a lot of organizations, there was a fundraising department and a communications department and an events department and a volunteer management department and maybe a grassroots organizing group, and all of those were sort of independently operating. And you know, as the tools for outreach have become more sophisticated. Uh, you know, the need for coordination and collaboration between those different groups has increased. And the other truth is that as the world has become more digitally sophisticated, the relationships you have with your audience are longer term. They're not three months, they're three years. And to sort of plan for that, you have to have sort of both a long term view and a sort of uh, collaborative mentality. And, you know, that causes things to break down in a number of places, you know. Probably the, the, the most obvious is sort of the governance of these shared systems. You know, it's not uncommon for the fundraising team to own the CRM and the communications team to own the email tool and, you know, the volunteer management team to own a separate tool and so on and so forth. And, you know, that means that even just letting people know in other departments when you're going to make a change that might impact them, you know, and that change could be how you categorize your audience. It could be, you know, how you store demographics. It could be whether or not you pull information back from a system into a, a shared system. You know, all those things need to be sort of coordinated and announced. And the other piece of that is that sometimes another department needs something that you could provide, but you don't need it. And so you don't provide it. And so that's another place where governance can really help sort of solve those problems. But, you know, breaks down there a lot in organizations. Um, budgeting and life cycle is another place where things happen, you know, where a tool can either long outlast its utility because it's serving one department's use case, but it's not serving the organization's use case, or that uh, the flip side can happen. A system gets replaced that another team was relying on and they didn't know about it and they didn't adjust their business processes and they didn't have a change management plan. Suddenly they're scrambling or the level of service that they're offering to the, your audience drops because of the system's replacement. And so managing the budgeting and life cycle planning process is another place that takes just a lot of facilitation and coordination. And then, you know, this long-term audience cultivation, um, we often, work with organizations that have sort of like a, you know, young leaders or new leaders kind of program where they're really helping people um, get off the ground in their career. And they build a lot of affinity with those folks, but they don't keep up with them. And in five or six years, and those people are mid-career or starting to break into their late career and have a lot of influence or a lot of ability to direct funding or other sorts of things that organizations might care about, they don't have that connection with them because they didn't plan for like long-term audience cultivation. They're really focused on getting someone from you know, a social media post to a donation, but not a long-term relationship with them. And that's just another piece where it takes a lot of people working together to make that happen. And finally, just tech, technical expertise. It's very common for different departments to be stronger or weaker in different areas, to have better visual design teams, to have better, you know, sort of uh, data strategy teams, things like that. And, you know, how that expertise is sort of used across the organization often could be improved with a little facilitation coordination and just kind of letting people know like, hey, if you share a little budget here or you, you know, sort of fractionally fund this position, we suddenly we can all benefit from this. Um, so, you know, why are those things breaking down? You know, I think that's 
one of the things that people wonder, everyone has the best intentions, you know, when they start these and everybody, you know, thinks they're being a good, you know, teammate and collaborator with their other partners in the organization. And one of the reasons that it is hard is that these problems creep up on you slowly. You know, it's sort of like the, uh, the frog in the pot. Why doesn't he jump out of the pot? You know, and, and the problem is that, you know, when things like non-standardized uh, categories for audiences or different uh, naming conventions for topics of interest are used across different systems, the impacts of those are not realized for a long time. And often they're realized only when you try and do something more sophisticated. All of your base, basic outreach is in, not impacted by those lack of standards, but when you want to do something a little more fancy, a little bit more data-driven, or a little bit more personalized, that's where those troubles start to pop up. And usually that's in the late game, not at the beginning. Related to that, you know, it's not really anyone's job to manage these holistic things within most organizations. If you have a CTO or a CIO, they're typically focused on making sure the organization works effectively. And that includes all sorts of things from information security to making sure laptops work to, you know, making sure the bills get paid on time, picking hosting vendors, um, you know, managing email security. There's so much on their plate. They're rarely focusing on the outreach or marketing function. And often the people in those roles don't come from a background where they have a lot of exposure to marketing and outreach needs. And so they tend to not be uh, focused on your outreach platform or your audience engagement, even if they have that technical uh, capability. COO's office, the chief operating officer, they're often a great place for this role to live or for this kind of function to live, but they have a million things on their plate too. And just between budgeting, staffing and interdepartmental management, they often can't focus on this effectively. Next sort of group that you might think is the communications department. They often have the most outreach tools. So they're kind of the leading edge of your audience engagement. They're out there meeting the new people your organization interacts with. But they often have these firewalls that prevent them from owning all the systems. Hey, don't get involved in fundraising. Oh, or for our own benefit, we're not going to get involved in the volunteer management system. You know, how can we kind of keep our scope of work reasonable? And so they tend to kind of create breaks where they don't sort of expand and manage the whole organization. The events department, you know, just forget about it. There's so much intensity and so much firefighting on the events department side. They rarely are going to uh, have the wherewithal to cover the entire outreach uh, stack or think about how audiences are engaged long term. Fundraising is usually typically the most invested and interested in long term relationships and in holistic relationships. Um, you know, the challenge for them is that they are not as invested in the day to day contact and on the early parts of the funnel. And their team is often uh, very sort of results focused. You know, how is this leading to donation? And they can track all of that. And so that creates some data disincentives for them to own a lot of the speculative long term planning of the outreach stack. Then finally, if you do have folks focused on volunteering or on grassroots organizing, um, that's another place where there's a lot of interest and expertise on this, but it tends to be seasonal. You know, they tend to have strong areas of volunteering or particular political campaigns they're focusing on. And again, it just kind of shortens the timeline and things they're looking for. So, you know, there's ends up, there's not anyone in the organization who's managing these problems or focused on these problems typically. And, you know, the flip side of that is it's really expensive to hire for this role. If you already have a CIO or CTO, hiring another one seems like a real luxury. And most departments don't have the uh, wherewithal to hire somebody like this just within their own department. It tends to be something that needs to be cross-departmental or in the executive team or the steering team or whatnot. And so it's really difficult for there to be a funded position that can, can handle this. And so you know, that leads to this, this sort of miasma. How can we get out of this? And you might be wondering, who can save us? Who can save us from this terrible fate? And, you know, it's a good question. Like, we need somebody who can solve these problems. We think about the long-term interconnections of our platforms, managing them, and, you know, helping improve the situation so you can reach those more sophisticated and more meaningful ways to engage your audience. And that person, whoever that person is, you know, needs to be thinking about how the outreach systems fit together. You know, they need to be thinking about how that actually feels on the outside. You know, it's really common for somebody who's on the outside to get an email that looks a certain way, to go to the website and it's a slightly different feel, to maybe come to a volunteer event and see and have a different experience. And that all sort of uh, creates friction in your brand. You know, you're not creating a unified brand experience. You're not sort of making them feel like they're part of a cohesive whole. And that's often because you're jumping between departments that aren't coordinated and their systems aren't coordinated and even the visual branding isn't always coordinated. And then you need someone who's focused on the long game. You know, a lot of this audience engagement takes, you know, at least a year, if not multiple years to kind of grow because 
you're having a sort of a value arrangement with your audiences. You're trading them information, you're building affinity and trust with them, and you're helping them advance their personal brand and their career through your interaction with them. And you know, that's just not something that happens overnight. They might give you a donation when they're feeling very you know, motivated or having a, a, there's a crisis in the world that they want to help support, but that's a little different from having a long-term and high affinity relationship with them. You know, and I think to do that, you know, you need sort of more mature tactics. You know, you shouldn't be sending the same uh, outreach to someone who's been with you for five years as somebody who has just signed up for your mailing list. And that's like instinctually true, but it's actually really difficult to turn into operational truth. And, you know, to do that, you need somebody sort of thinking about what are the different stages of engagement with our audiences and how do all these uh, technical platforms and outreach platforms fit into that? And what's the data model we need behind all those things to kind of know when to send somebody the right content, when to you know, segment them into different audience segments that receive different content, and how does that all going to work? And how do I sort of train the different teams and get the other teams on board with this sort of segmented plan of attack? And you know, part of that is creating resiliency because you know, every organization suffers turnover and with technical systems that are complex and hard to learn and there might be a steep adoption curve, when somebody who really knows one of your outreach systems leaves, that can create a big gap in your audience experience. And you need somebody who's helping to think about that proactively. How can we minimize that gap? How can we fill it in quickly? How are we gonna manage the you know, always present turnover that is gonna be a truth forever. You know, it's not something you can avoid. You just need to plan into it. And then the other piece of it is you need somebody who's saying, we've done this for 10 years. We should stop doing it and do this other thing. And they need to be out there exploring what I call positive disruption. You know, how can they go out there and find things that will change the status quo in a positive way in your organization and do that in a meaningful and change managed way where people accept it and adopt it and find it useful versus just somebody who's, you know, lighting fires. <clears throat> so, who is this person? <laughs> Spoiler alert, it's the marketing CTO. <clears throat> you know, really what it takes is a, <clears throat> pardon me, my voice is going a little bit, a commitment to address these issues directly. <clears throat> and you need empathy to do that. You know, if you don't really understand the stress and the anxiety of the other people you're working with, oh, forgive me. <clears throat> then you're gonna have a, a problem um, sort of getting people to come on board with you. And it doesn't matter how good the plan is if the uh, resistance to it is high. And so there's this uh, acronym FRIMP that I like that is sort of facilitating conversations because a lot of it is just getting people to talk, make sure those conversations are factual and balanced and not sort of blame games. Someone who can receive the ideas and kind of enhance them and organize them and share them back out. <clears throat> Somebody who's sort of a trusted partner in that planning process. You need somebody who has a little more time to investigate and sort of understand what the real needs are. You know, often people will complain about something, but you have to really dig into it to understand the nuance of what the problem is. You know, it's usually a little tiny, important, intricate bit that needs to be changed. And it may not even be that hard to change, but somebody needs to investigate and figure that piece of the puzzle out to really move your platform forward. And that's part of the managing process. You know, a lot of this is communication, like letting people know what your plans are ahead of time, letting them see what the roadmap is, letting them influence the prioritization and the timing of those things and just kind of making sure that that's something that everybody can see and engage with. <coughs> and finally, it's really important to have somebody who can, you know, manage and massage different departmental budgets. Most of these tools are budgeted in one department, but they need to be budgeted across the whole organization. And that might not be easy, depending on how your organization manages budgeting and manages like how people pay for things and how tools are funded and depreciated. And if you're using capital expenditures for certain kinds of tool replacements. And so you need somebody who's kind of thinking about that, talking to everybody and kind of working out all the kinks in that so that when a change is proposed, the budgeting for it suddenly doesn't become a huge roadblock. You know, what are the skills that somebody like this needs, you know, and, uh, you know, this is something we get asked a lot. We're asked to like help people hire people or to suggest people for this role. And, you know, the truth of the matter is they need to be really good at managing up. You know, a lot of the, the, the sort of marketing CTO's job in any organization is to sort of say, hey, I'm going to take away all the technical systems here, all of the, you know, buzzwords, and I'm just going to turn this into a business question where, you know, there's this challenge, there are these pros and cons to different approaches. I recommend this approach, but you know, seeing the pros and cons of these different approaches, the you as a collective leadership team agree. And if you have that skill in your organization, 
managing your technical platform is suddenly going to become a thousand times easier because people will have trust and will be bought into the solutions and the choices that are made. Even if they don't understand all the technical implications of that, they'll understand the business implications, which is what's really important. You know, and related to that is having strong communication skills, you know, managing up sort of requires you to have some empathy and understand like if people are feeling anxious or if they're feeling tense or, you know, if you're feeling excited about things and kind of communicating what you want to those folks often means <clears throat> creating visuals for things that are abstract, you know, writing textual descriptions that are maybe a little longer form than you might to another technical person, but, you know, that will really help other people kind of see the challenge and see what you're trying to achieve. So there's strong communication skills that are really key. And, you know, empathy is important because when you're dealing with technology, it's often a black box to people. It often directly impacts their business performance. Um, they often feel really frustrated when they can't make it do what they want. And you have to have a lot of empathy for that if you're going to be successful in change management. You know, if you just say you're right and you, you might be right, that's not going to actually help change things as much as if you understand anxiety, you work with people, and you make them feel like they're being brought along on the path in a successful way that's going to make them personally successful. And, you know, that's part of the trust building as well that's really key to this position. You know, you can't be an autocrat and manage a collective. You know, I think that's... Uh, you know, hopefully it's actually true, but like, you know, in a lot of ways, the marketing CTO is somebody who builds trust by soliciting a lot of input and feedback. You know, they're asking people what they need, how they need it, when they need it. And they're saying, hey, I've brought all that together into a cohesive and useful plan, but it's not necessarily my plan. It's everyone's plan that I've just helped organize and facilitate. And, you know, when you look at this list, you might be wondering, I thought the CTO, you know, needed to be technical. <laughs> And, you know, it turns out um, that's a help. It's really helpful to have a technical background. You know, I was a developer for 10 years before I sort of got into, you know, more of the, the CTO style uh, leadership. But it turns out that many of the technical skills that you might think they need are readily available outside of your organization at an hourly rate. And, uh, you know, one of the tricks of the trade uh, is to use all of the expertise that's out there and just not be afraid of the sticker shock. <laughs> You can get somebody who's a Salesforce expert to spend three or four hours with you discussing options for hundred bucks an hour, $125 an hour. And that may sound expensive on an hourly rate, but the expertise imparted to you as a leader and the experience that you get from that is worth far more than that amount of money. And I think a lot of organizations think of it as a binary problem. We can either have a technical expert or we can't, as opposed to we can have an organizational expert, a management expert who can learn how to do those things or can bring in experts to help them understand the problems. You know, and I think that to do that effectively, you do need some comprehensive understanding of your outreach systems. You need to know what systems you have, how they're connected, which vendors and experts you have internally and what they're up to, but you don't necessarily have to be a deep expert or domain expert in each of those technologies. I think another piece that happens here is you have to be comfortable discovering and hiring outside help. A lot of people want to go it alone. But the truth of the matter is, the more experts you bring in, the more outside help you bring in, the smarter you're going to be, the, broader, the brighter, broader your perspective will be, and the more likely you are to make a good choice. And, you know, part of that is the process and governance. Like, even if you get expert advice from somebody, they may say, you should just do this tomorrow. But you have to kind of step back and say, oh, I need to do this at the time when the organization will be receptive for it. And have I done all the groundwork to make the organization receptive for it? And so part of it is always balancing your technical need and expertise of the knowledge of what needs to be done with your business knowledge of what the organization can adopt and absorb and actually achieve with that change. So you might be saying, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm buying this. This all starting to make sense, but uh, yeah, we still don't have a marketing CTO and I don't think we have the budget for one. So what are we gonna do? And, uh, you know, the truth is, it's possible to get many of the benefits of having a dedicated marketing CTO with just some of your existing staff, you know, if you're willing to sacrifice or devote a few hours a month to this management process from your team. You know, and I think one of the challenges here is that the team has to come together and think about how they're going to govern first, and the executive team of your organization needs to give them the power to govern. And I think that's one of the challenges for the CTO by committee. You know, each department using or managing our system has to participate, you know, or at least a large percentage of them do. You know, it doesn't help if only half the team that does manage the outreach systems is involved. The governance and decision making rules that you adopt have to allow for relatively quick decision making. You know, if a decision takes six months to make, 
that might be okay, but it's probably too long. And you're going to need to work with your organization and your leadership to develop a process that lets the decisions be made a little more quickly. I think another part of that is that the CDO by committee needs to have a lot of sunlight. And this is one of the challenges a lot of organizations, especially if there's not a already built out internet that everyone uses or some other place to kind of show this, but you need a very sort of public backlog of changes and enhancements to the systems. And you need all of the participants and all the departments to be able to look at that and plan their own sort of change management processes around that. And also sort of impact things to say, hey, I really need this you know, to be a slow period. Can we not have change during that period? That's the kind of thing that a public roadmap or a public backlog of enhancements can help you find and, and discover. And I think the other piece of this is that CTO by committee only works if the departments agree to sort of jointly fund and license the systems involved. They all have to have a sort of shared ownership of it and a shared uh, stake in the game. And that also helps when, uh, you know, a system replacement comes up, you know, different departments can weigh in on, you know, is the value proposition good or not for them to make that systems change. And then, you know, as I mentioned, the committee really needs to be able to hire expert help. It's really valuable for a committee of folks who are not focused on technology day to day to have somebody come in and just kind of explain like what's happening with the system or this tool, what's the landscape out there of other systems that are coming up and you know what you're competing against, should you stay or should you go on the platform you are, all those sorts of things an expert can come in and help you quickly decide without having to be there full time. So that's one way to handle this is you have the CTO by committee. The other way, and this is probably the most common way we see it, uh, the clients we work with, is the knighted non-technical CTO. Somebody who is sort of blessed by the organization to come forth and manage the technology stack or the engagement platform. You know, and maybe this goes without saying, but it is worth mentioning that this person should be pretty charismatic and should be well liked by your executive team or at least by your department heads because they're going to have often not a lot of executive clout to make these things happen. And that's why this particular approach can be challenging is that these people tend to be the most technically skilled in your organization, but not necessarily the highest ranking or the people who have the most pull. And so that means that they have to utilize a lot of soft power to make things happen. You know, they have to have strong communication skills. Um, they need uh, to continue to develop their own technical skills and sometimes their personal, interpersonal manage up skills. And so they often need a development budget attached when they get knighted. Um, they very much need outside experts and advisors because that helps build credibility with other department heads and other people in the organization. If they can say, I've examined this problem myself, and then I brought in an outside expert and they've either validated or helped improve the path path forward. So that's really important. And then, you know, they may need a new boss, like who the, the you know, the knighted CTO uh, reports to is really important. And, you know, typically if they're within one department, that's kind of you know, debating and working with other departments and how the outreach platform should work or part of one of the stovepipes you already have in your organization, that's not the right place for this person to sit. Often they need to be reporting to the COO or the executive director or somebody higher up who can give them kind of a neutrality between departments, but also give them a little bit more gravitas if they need to go and, and get a decision made or need to like get some people in the room who are avoiding them for some reason. So this is totally a possibility, but just know there's some, some pieces of the puzzle that need to happen to make it successful. So let's go on to the quarterly course correction. <clears throat> this is a lot of uh, organizations default, which is that they will say a couple times a year, maybe not even every quarter, maybe every half year or a third of a year, we're gonna come together and we're gonna try and figure out what we want to do. Um, you know, the struggle with this is that there is a lot of value in this, at least you're addressing these problems and, and moving forward and looking at them. But a lot of the day to day nuance and a lot of the day to day feedback about frustrations, wants, ideas, you know, things that can be improved aren't captured in a quarterly way, right? They're captured in a day to day way or a weekly way. So you need to really focus if you want to do a sort of just a quarterly course correction where there's no one really managing it day to day on mechanisms that let people have an inbox or other ways to just kind of put their complaints in the box and whatnot. And you can like look through those and have a process to review those before this meeting comes together. The quarterly course correction tends to take a lot of time. Um, you know, that needs to be planned almost like a major event. You know, somebody needs to do a lot of prep work for this. They need to come together, hear everybody's complaints and needs, sift through that, organize it, try and categorize it. Um, they need to brief each of the departmental champions and people who are coming to the workshops. Agendas need to be set. Often there need to be different discussion times figured out. And it usually is pretty time consuming for everyone involved. It's like a half day or a full day of planning every quarter, every time you have one of these meetings to kind of go through all that information. So 
It's definitely possible, um, but it's not necessarily the best. And so this is kind of a, a little bit of a, uh, an option of last resort, or maybe a starting point for sort of adding on to your sophistication over time. And it's also important you have a facilitator. I should just mention that, that uh, these meetings tend to be a little contentious uh, or people can you know, easily have strong opinions in them. And it's really important to have a, a clear facilitator um, figured out beforehand. And often it's good if they're sort of a neutral party. So this takes us to our last one. So maybe my favorite one. There's a little picture of me on there, which is the uh, the fractional CTO. So you know this is our our little sort of personal plug, but we do a lot of this for organizations where you know we will offload a lot of that platform management and engagement planning um, from your organization. And you know we're a neutral party, so it often helps. And we've often done stakeholder interviews when we come in, but. Even if it's not us, you, there are lots of fractional marketing CTOs out there, people who have deep technical skills and are kind of doing this on a consulting basis. And that consulting experience gives you a lot of the manage up skills and communication skills you need for this. And you can often find uh, marketing CTOs or fractional support with people who are expert in at least one, if not multiple parts of your outreach platform. So that's another nice thing is you can kind of fit people who have that already built-in expertise and breadth of expertise at other organizations to come in and help your organization. And, you know, they can range from, you know, being there an hour a week to being there, you know, a half a day or a day a week, but, you know, you can kind of figure out a way that works for you. And the nice thing about this is that often these folks are engaged on a weekly basis, if not a daily basis. And so they hear a lot more, they know a lot more about what's going on, and they're able to kind of bring that plan together in a little bit uh, smoother and easier way because they're capturing a lot of information right from the get-go rather than having to kind of deep dive with people every quarter or whatnot to find that stuff out. You know, and the truth of the matter is, you might be able to be this person, you know? <laughs> you know, if you're in this meeting and you're thinking, maybe I could be a marketing CTO, you might, you might be right. You know, I think there's a couple of things you can do to get started on this. Um, you know, there's ways to assess your engagement platform's current health. Like, where are you starting from? Where are the challenges? And sometimes that's the best way to start a conversation inside your organization is just kind of say like, hey, we're here. You know, I think we could be here. These are the benefits that would, uh, you know, we would receive from that. And I think it would really help our bottom line or would help us engage your audience in these ways. So starting, starting the conversation there is part of starting an assessment of what needs to happen. It's really easy to run a workshop internally if you can get people to, you know, commit a little time to it, where you can kind of think about the cross dependable challenges and needs, the things you might need, like a shared taxonomy between departments, that sort of stuff. You know, sometimes it's just a conversation, a facilitated conversation in a workshop can uncover a lot of it and build a lot of shared momentum and that sort of shared support for it. So once you kind of know where the challenges are, having a little workshop like that is a good way to kind of get started and dive in a little bit. And then, you know, begin planning your technology roadmap. You know, once you have people bought into like what they want to change and how things could be improved, sort of starting to put those on paper is a really good way. It might not be funded yet. You might not have everyone's total buy-in yet, but you're starting to come up with a plan and people are so much better at editing a plan from a non-blank piece of paper than a blank piece of paper. If you give them something and they say, oh, that's not right, they're gonna adjust it and make it better. And they're gonna start to feel some ownership and some investment in it. Versus if you say, hey, give me a roadmap and it's a blank piece of paper, they're gonna probably come back with a blank piece of paper. So it's really valuable to kind of start putting all of those things after you have sort of a workshop like that together on that roadmap and sort of figure out your path forward. And then, you know, as you do that, it's not uncommon that you find there's missing pieces of your engagement architecture. And, you know, we have a lot of thoughts on that. Um, one of the things I you know, linked to here was a contact model. So how do you actually track and manage each audience member? Like, what's the data on there? Which systems have the data? Can you put all that data in one place? Like, is there processing you need to do on that data? Like, hey, if they've come to like three events and open three emails in the last month, do we put them in the likely donor bucket? And can we put that as like a processed like tag or signal on their contact record. So it's easy to find those folks without having to remember all those rules all the time. There's things like that that you can start to bring together. And, you know, if you do this over time, suddenly you start to find that you're unlocking a lot of those more sophisticated and powerful outreach, you know, possibilities, things like personalization or optimization or automation. I mean, all those things require, you know, the systems and the platforms to be working well together and the contact model and the data model behind these things to kind of support that kind of interaction in a way that feels positive. So yeah, I think it's, like I said, it's a conversation is all you need to start, you know, bring these people together, you know, like get people thinking about these problems, but, you know, don't, don't let them languish. You know, I think a lot of organizations are saying our department's working great, but, you know, it's really about your organization working well, and it's about your audience experience, you know, 
building and being more sophisticated and more meaningful to your audiences over time. You know, you want somebody who's been consuming and being involved with the organization for two or three years to have really high affinity, to be a brand supporter, and to really help your organization enhance and move its mission forward. And that can only happen if you you know, really focus on them and have empathy for them and figure out how you need to build your system and your tools to support them. So, yeah, thank you all for your time. Uh, yeah, this has been great. Uh, if you want to continue the conversation or if you have any questions, I'll, uh, I'll let Nardos or anybody pop up here and let me know if there's been any questions during the conversation, but my Calendly link is up here. You can schedule a, a meeting with me anytime and we'll chat about stuff. And my LinkedIn and our company LinkedIn is on here and we do have a little project thing there. If you're already like, oh my gosh, I have a project in mind, you can go to our little project planner and, and pop in there. And we'd love it if you just fill out our survey um, from this link as well and let us know what you thought. And if there were any things we didn't cover that you wished we had, or you know, any uh, you know insights you have that you'd like to just kind of share with the group, we'd, we'd love to hear those too. So thank you. Awesome, thank you, Nate. Um, we did have a couple of questions. Um, in regards to advocating for the position, are there any ex suggestions that you can make for getting prepared to um, start those conversations to get ahead of the politics at all? Yeah, so the first thing I think is to start the conversation like not with, uh, we need to hire this person, but more so we have these organizational challenges that we need to overcome. You know, and I think that the thing you wanna do and build consensus around is this idea that there are these things in the organization that are holding you back from the best value your organization could have. And in a lot of ways, the thing that's holding you back is creating a lack of return on investment from the effort you're already spending, right? Like most teams are already spending tons of effort conducting outreach. You know, it's not that people aren't putting their backs into having great audience experiences. It's that the efforts they're doing are limited because they're using, you know, like simple hand tools instead of like electric driven machine tools and things like that. And you know, if you can kind of get the challenge um, to be the focal point of the solution, and then you can say, I think one of the solutions, if not the best solution to solving these challenges that we all agree are important and would, you know, derive organizational value from is to hire somebody to manage these pieces. And here are the concrete things they're going to do. That really helps. You can say like, they're going to help organize this taxonomy and implement it in all our systems. They're going to help build a data model that helps us, you know, capture and manage context over the long term. They're going to work with each of the departments to help coordinate their budgets. And as you list those things out, the time commitments required for each of those are going to become really apparent. And you know, then the question is, we have these things we want to accomplish. We have these concrete actions that need to be done. How are we going to fund those with staff time? And now you're in a really good place, I think, to start talking about that higher. So that's kind of the approach I would take. Great, thank you so much. Um, another question about recruitment strategy. Um, if you are working in an organization that has not had a position similar to this or with these technological skill sets, how do you educate yourself as an organization on where to look for the best talent for the position? Yeah, well, I think um, there's a number of ways. Probably the simplest way is just to go to one of the big like um, freelancer recruiter sites look for a freelancer who seems a little more senior and uses one of the tools you use and hire them for an hour and just ask them those questions. You know, I think there's a lot of industry expertise in the people who freelance and, and are knowledgeable about these tools because they've probably learned those tools working in another organization, working with a group of people, just even knowing how they onboarded it to those tools. So there's a lot of ways to bootstrap your way into finding the right experts by already investigating people who claim to be experts. And it's not necessarily the first freelancer you find is gonna be great, but it's a really quick and cheap way. And I think, you know, a lot of times that, especially in mission-driven organizations, the idea of spending like 150 bucks to have like an hour conversation feels like, ah, oh, like really anxiety producing. But the actual cost to value ratio is immense there. You're saving yourself, you know, hours, if not weeks of time, and you're really getting quickly to people who are experts. So. I'd say, please try and leverage the community of experts that are out there to find the right experts. But don't assume the first person you pick will be that, just that they're kind of an entryway into the great community of people to like ask and, and become knowledgeable about you know, who can advise you. Great suggestion, thank you. Um, now, when you talked about being the person who could potentially step into this role. Um, you know, that's, I guess, the other side of recruitment is kind of recruiting yourself almost. So how do you prepare yourself outside of the organizational and product management side of the change for your own role? How do you prepare yourself for this position? 
Yeah, that's a really good, good, uh, good question. I think the first thing is to think about how you're going to sort of split up your week and to give yourself some different pie wedges of time that you're going to focus on. And, you know, I think those are things that, that are really good to be intentional about, even though they sound sort of like basic at the beginning, but how much time are you setting aside to do sort of stakeholder interviews with the different departments each week? You know, where are you going to document and capture these things in a way that you can share them back with people and sort of demonstrate value by, you know, just writing down what they told you. I mean, it's amazing at so many organizations how there's this kind of like cottage industry knowledge or, you know, like folk wisdom about how they do their outreach, but they would love to have that stuff written down. And often it just takes somebody interviewing them, spending a little time writing it up, maybe making a few diagrams. And if you hand that back to them, you're suddenly building a lot of affinity and a support. And, you know, part of your week and your planning for, you know, taking on this role needs to be thinking through, what's my value proposition back to the people I'm servicing? And that's usually different from somebody's previous role where they're, I need to make my boss happy, right? Like, so there's a mindset change that needs to happen where you're thinking about how you can build value within the organization and affinity within the organization through your work in that role. Because all of the good grace and all of the good energy that you build as you learn about what people need can be spent and will need to be spent actually getting them to change what they're doing in the future and adopt and get on board with change management, the things you want to improve. And so the big change here is probably a little bit of a value exchange mindset. Um, that's a really key one. I think from a just like practical perspective, like doing things like Toastmasters and whatnot is really valuable. I think if you don't feel comfortable being a public speaker or you don't feel comfortable being a, a convincing speaker, I think that's a really important area to focus on. And there are a lot of good skills trainings for salespeople. I hate to say that because people hate sales, salespeople, but uh, around this skill called active listening. And you know, active listening is, is what it sounds like. You just, you're really paying attention to what people say. And instead of waiting for your turn to speak, you're processing and thinking about what they say, and then you're reacting to it and trying to really respond to what was said to you in a really empathetic way. And having that sort of skill set is extremely valuable. And so there's a lot of sort of the soft skill side I'd say people should work on. Um, and the other piece of it is just, you need to kind of think about how you're going to organize all this data. Like it's really easy for there to be mounds of data and it for not to be useful or lots of documentation and it not be useful. You really need to think through your sort of your own content strategy for how you're going to manage all of these things. And, you know, that's really valuable. So that when somebody asks you a question, you can quickly share with them the answer, share with them where they can discover the answer. And you can make it additive because at the beginning, often you're going to be the person managing all of this documentation and all these systems diagrams and the roadmap and all that. But if you're successful over time, you're going to democratize that and there's going to be more people involved. And that's where, you know, the system not being your weird personal like hodgepodge system is really going to pay off. If you have like a thought out system that you feel comfortable and proud of sharing with other people, you're going to be able to enroll them into your, your process more easily. And so that's a really key part of being successful here is that you're a facilitator. You're not somebody who owns these things. Great. Thank you so much. That was really great information. Um, if anyone else has any questions to add, please do so now. But otherwise, I think we're going to get ready to wrap up. Um, oh, Liza Hogan had a question. What tool or software do you use for organizing this type of data? Yeah, it's a great question. So we have evolved uh, many way, many times in different systems for uh, for this. You know, we started out using Confluence, which is a, a wiki software for this, and we actually still use it. So it's actually been pretty foundational for us. But over time, we've moved more and more of this kind of information to Miro, which is a, uh, a real time kind of dashboarding system where you can kind of like drag and drop things and multiple people can get in there and collaborate with things. And it's really useful because it kind of lets us both have static documentation and visual diagrams next to each other. And it lets us collaborate really easily on it. So we're doing a lot in Miro right now um, to kind of manage and, and sort of create this. And it kind of has a low barrier to entry and lets people feel like it's a little more fun. So those are all really positive things. Um, I would say though, that for us, a lot of it is about where our team spends their time. You know, we try and make sure that these things are accessible and, you know, not, another thing that's a barrier to entry to learn. So if your organization already has a place that they are sort of like centered on and focused on for knowledge management, even if it's not ideal, sometimes that's the best place. So I just kind of caveat with saying that our tool set was also based on our cultural history about how we pick tools and work together and collaborated remotely. Great, did anyone else have any uh, questions before we? wrap up here maintaining that kind of wiki or you know 
you know, record of that knowledge on behalf of your clients or just to have insight about them or, you know, agency operations in the same way? Yeah, it's a great question. So we we do both. Um, we have a wiki for every single client, or we have a wiki space for every single client where we document our technical approach, everything we've discovered about them. We also use another product called Teamwork, which is kind of like a project portal software, and it has a like much crappier but still useful wiki functionality in it. And we actually put a lot of our evergreen client-facing documentation in there so they can be involved in it, and then. I will say for some clients, we actually go into their knowledge management systems and either build or transport yeah. our stuff in there. Yeah. So like one of our clients is uh, super duper into Microsoft. And so they have SharePoint. And even though I don't really love SharePoint, we have built uh, documentation in SharePoint so that it is like, you know, accessible and everybody's cool with it and knows where to find it. And, you know, in a lot of ways, the collaboration is so much more important than the quality of the documentation. I hate to say that because documentation is very important, but, you know, people looking at it and consuming it is the key and feeling a part of it. So. Yeah, we, we, will, we will both manage it for ourselves and for our clients. Um, that's another nice thing about Miro is that it's not internal for us. Like we can easily add clients to it and then they can own it. And um, yeah, I mean, we've also used Lucid charts. Um, there's a lot of different systems that are valuable for this. And one thing that's interesting, just slightly side pandemic related technology changes is that everybody who made some form of online collaboration is now adding documentation to it you know like the ability to keep and manage documentation to it and like lucid charts like an example like they just launched their like real-time board competitor to miro just like last week or something so I, I think there's a bunch of tools that are starting to get really good at this and, and microsoft teams has actually improved a ton in the last two years so it's actually pretty competitive now too i'd say so All right, well, guys, do well, you have any other questions? Last go around. All right, I think we're good to wrap up. Um, we will be sending out uh, further communication with the recording of this webinar. Um, Nate, if you have any closing remarks, uh, feel free to take the mic. Oh, thank you. No, this has been great. Um, I just think it's really valuable for a lot of organizations to start uh, diving into this and, and you know, taking this bull by the horns. And if there's anything we can do to help you, uh, let us know. Like, uh, grab my uh, an event on my Calendly thing. We'll chat. So thank you. I appreciate it.